Well, good evening. It's uh, time for us to begin our five o'clock uh, Bible class. And uh, as we begin, I wanted to start out by making an announcement, uh, or an amended announcement, maybe a better way to put it. On Sunday morning, uh, the 22nd of November, so this is a little slight little change. Uh, the 21st is on a Saturday, and it'll actually be on the 22nd. That following that Sunday morning will be the ladies meeting after church in the morning period as opposed to the evening. So Sunday morning, the 22nd following the morning service, the ladies will meet uh, for that time period. And uh, just wanted to let everyone know that if you need to make that change. Is there any other announcements that might need to be made at this time? Okay, if nothing else, let's begin and we'll go to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we're so thankful for every day that you give us life. And Father, we pray that we use that to glorify and to honor you with every move that we make. Father, we pray that as we enter into this Bible class period, that you will help us to understand the way that you would have us to live so that we can live every day in a better way to glorify you. Father, forgive us from our sins as we repent of them. And we pray all this through Christ's name. Amen. We're going to begin by singing some songs. Uh, we'll begin with Jesus Loves Me. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. So big, right? My God is so big, so strong and so mighty, there's nothing my God cannot do. My God is so big, so strong and so mighty, there's nothing my God cannot do. We read about God at? In the, Bible. in the Bible. What is the Bible? The book. It's a book. Yeah, it's a book that contains what? It's got how many books are in the Bible? Let me ask that question. You know that one? Nine. There's at least nine. How many, uh, how many books in all is the Bible? 66. That's right. And all of the Bible is the Word of God, right? So that's what we're talking about when we talk about the Bible. It's, it's the Word of God. And are you supposed to read it or are you supposed to not read it? Read it. You're supposed to read it. How often? Every day. Every day. What happens if you read it every day? You get happier. You get happier? All right. The more we read the Bible, the Bible. Yeah, the, uh, the first part's called the. New. Not the first part's not called the new. The first part's the. Old. The Old Testament, and what's the the second part? The new. the new Testament. Yeah. 
Do you know your New Testament books of the Bible? We're going to see. We're going to sing our song. Remember, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. All right. Here we go. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Acts and letters to the Romans. First and second Corinthians. Galatians and Ephesians. Philippians, Colossians. First and second Thessalonians. First and second Timothy. Titus and Philemon. So we, we went through a study where we broke the Bible up, the whole Bible, from the very beginning up to the very end into 17 parts. Y'all remember doing that? Y'all remember that? And we, what is the first part? What is the first period? That's called the what? That's before the flood, all right? What, what's the last one? Ooh, that might be harder. The Letters to the Christians. All right, so we're gonna we're gonna go through these, and we'll we'll sing the seventeen periods of Bible history. Okay. I don't, I don't, we need to get back to it. We've spent a lot of time since we've we've sang this song, so I wanted to maybe uh, make sure we don't forget it. All right. Before the flood, the flood, the scattering of the people, the patriarchs, the Exodus, the wandering in the wilderness. Invasion and conquest, judges united kingdom, the fighting kingdom, Judah alone, captivity and return. Years of silence, life of Christ, the early church, the letters to Christians, things of the 17th period, the Bible history. Well, good job. Y'all did great. We are going to look at the Ten Commandments as we have been looking at on Sunday evening. What did we uh, What did we talk about last week? What was the commandment that we went over last week? You, murder, murder, and doing it or not. not doing it? Okay, yeah, not you shall not murder. So that was that's what we looked at last week, uh, and this week we're going to look at number seven: you shall not commit adultery. And this will, uh, this is very, uh, I think, uh, I don't know that it's ever not been uh, a pertinent subject matter, unfortunately. Uh, and it is given as a command because it gives us uh, the definition and the roots and the basis for God's design for sexual activity. Uh, we have all been, as humums, given... Uh, a, if you will, a, a powerful, extremely powerful force that is our sex drive. And some feel embarrassed or ashamed or uncomfortable in discussing about this and, and, and even feel ashamed that they have it, perhaps. Uh, but this is the fact of the matter is that it is something that has been given to us by our Creator. But also with that is coming the command, you shall not commit adultery. So we have a very basic, clear, cut and dry uh, command here that says this. This sex only belongs inside of marriage. Marriage is only happening between two people and it is only two people of the opposite sex, male and female. So within these five words, we can gain so much information of God's design and God's plan for sex in our lives. There are two extremes that kind of go along with this subject and the subject matter and looking at God's design and God's plan. Uh, we have like Puritanism or the extreme Puritanism, if you will, where sex and everything that is connected with it is considered dirty or base or unworthy somehow and it should never uh, be discussed and it should be put away. And then there's also this idea of extreme worldliness where sex is everything and stimulation and instant gratification and all of this is normal and it should be flaunted and it should be put out in the open and everyone should just be wild and crazy about it and this is the only thing that matters. And, and when we look at our society and specifically uh, within our 
a lot of our Western American culture, this is more of the way in which we tend to go. And I think looking at it through history, we see that there was a great transfer, if you will, from this Puritan type thinking to the worldliness that is so rampant today and, and, the, and what is set up and set forth. And so we will, uh, we just wanted to make mention of that and, and think about that. And to be full sexually requires that we obey God's commands in the Bible concerning sex. So if we wanted to uh, look at this, and if you want fulfillment from this activity, the only way that you're going to have that is because we were created by God with a drive, and the only way that drive will be satisfied is when we do it according to His plan and His pattern and His practice. And that is supposed to be between only a man and a woman and only within the holy bonds of matrimony. That is the only place that it is to rest and it is to be. And then you have people like this, and I'm probably the only person to ever have Hugh Hefner in a PowerPoint for a Bible class. But you have people that, that this stigma here, that when you see that you think, well, that's what he's all about is this worldliness, and, and, and that is the whole thing. And he created a whole and really drove an industry that was created about flaunting it and, and seeking it out upon however means you need and totally ignoring God and totally ignoring the needs that a person has that has been given to them by God and how it is to be treated. Uh, so the rules about sex, as I mentioned, is for husbands and wives. It is to come after marriage and not before, and God blesses sex within a marriage. Brother Robert brought up an excellent point uh, after we had finished last week, and it was based, And this is the, to sum it up. If you ignore, say, the first four commands, that there's only one God, that you're going to create, treat God and His name with holy and with reverence, and you're, and you're going to set apart part of your life to honor and to give to God, and, and you're going to put God in His appropriate place, which is to be the ruler of our lives, if you do not do those things, then the rest of the commandments don't really matter. I, I mean, because you've thrown God out the window, and now it's open to anything. And when we look at Romans chapter 1 and the things that these people did and the things that they were filled up with and the things that God gave them up to and God handed them over for were all, were all evil things because they did not do one thing. What was the one thing that these people liked to do? Because you chose to serve the creation rather than the creator. You have not honored God as God. All of these things will now be associated in your life. And of all things that we have, we as a society, and unfortunately, even at times, us within the church have thrown out the window, it is these rules about sex. Because we quit honoring God as God, and we quit revering Him in the place that He rightfully deserves. And so we have decided to put our own needs and our own feelings and our own emotions in place of the thing that God has set up for us. When we look at this and... and the society within, uh, let's say, rule number one. Uh, what makes a marriage a marriage? If we're, we're, we're going to look at, it's for husbands and wives, and the only way that you become a husband and wife is that you get married. Uh, uh, there, there's, two, there's two little kids here that got married, and uh, for a long, long time we, we told Lawson, we said, you can't, you can't kiss anybody until you're married. That's the only time you can kiss anybody. Well, he took it upon himself to, to kiss her at preschool the other day. Uh, and we don't do that, do we? No, no. And, and we, we asked about it. And when asked about, why, Lawson, why did you do that? He said, well, Mama, we're married now. We can do that. And so, uh, of course, we, we've talked about this with them and, and even... And, and even Bruce and I, but we thought, you know, what a good thing that they recognize, uh, even at a young age, the purpose of marriage it is a man and a woman. It is between two people, and, and it's not to be messed around with. And marriage is different than, you know, just a normal relationship that you may have with someone else. That marriage is different. And so what sets apart marriage from maybe another relationship? What? Well, let's not, hold on, let me back up. What is marriage? Let me go back to that original question. What is marriage? 
Two people become one. I think that's a perfect definition for marriage. You have a man and a woman deciding that it is no longer us individuals. We are now going to be one. Brother Dwight. And they're joined together by God. And they're joined together by God. It, this is something that, as we have said within uh, many of our marriage vows and what God has joined together, let not man put asunder. It, it is something that, has, that is different. It is something that God has put together. So that there is our in lines with our husbands and wives and is also something that is uh, recognized legally by many people. It, it is something that marriage is something that uh, carries over even from nation to nation. Uh, it seems like even in other countries and other cultures, there is marriage. Now, they may not think of marriage the same the way that we think about it, but they do set apart a distinction between a relationship between a man and a woman in a, in a different kind of way within a wedding or a marriage ceremony. Uh, within this, when we think about number two, sex comes after marriage, not before. This is the very basis for you saying that I'm going to live life by God's principles and by God's standards. And, and with our, I'm going back to our society and the things of which we see every day in movies and, and, and TV shows and even books and, and a whole uh, genre of film, films are geared toward, you know, it doesn't matter that you're not married. And marriage is not even brought up. Uh, you know, it's like, well, we're not married yet, but we've been living together for 16 years. Well, what in the world are you, why are you not married? What is it in, within you that you have, why have you not gotten married. Well, you're indulging in all of the things that are sacred and set aside for marriage according to God's platter, pattern and God's plan, but yet you've introduced that before marriage. You've got the cart before the horse, so to speak. Whenever sex enters in before marriage, it begins to, even if you are, even if you end up marrying the one of whom you are having sex with, then you have still kind of got things off kilter. You've put things in a different pattern. And I, and I know this is probably even, well, this is the one I'm going to marry. We're going to get married. You know, we've got our date lined up. We've got all of these things set aside and, and made a point that we're going to get married. Uh, but we've still not done things according to God's plan. And even with that comes more problems and will come and will become problem for you even after you are married. Well, why? Well, because what else led up to that? And, and not only that, but when we think about uh, some of the blessings that come from sex, uh, we think about childbirth. And if we we even even in some parts of society today, they still believe that having a child out of wedlock is something that's wrong. But sex is totally acceptable, and so. Why, where are our standards? We have set up our own standards and thrown God's standards and plan out the window. Uh, number three, God blesses sex within marriage and within marriage alone. Uh, within the marriage, this is something that is freely expressed between these two people and it should be without fear or shame. That is something that is shared between them that has physically made the two individuals one. Uh, you have become one together, and by doing this, you should be able to share not only all, all of your physical body, but also all of your emotional and feelings and thoughts should be all out in the open. Because you share this bond and you share this union with only one other person who is now your helpmate for life. So if we set up kind of these three rules right up at the beginning, we begin to understand God's mentality for it and God's attitude toward it even within the commandments. In the New Testament, in Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 4, we find out that God truly does bless sex within a marriage. Let marriage be held in honor among all. So who should honor a marriage? Everyone. It is not something that is just reserved for the two individuals, but everyone should be able to recognize a marriage as something that is different and should be honored because it is something that God has joined together. Let the marriage bed be undefiled, for God will judge the sexually immoral and the adulterous. So we are to recognize and to honor the marriage. So what, what does that mean? That means that if, that if I'm a single person and I see a married couple, 
that that's something that I should is in a like manner honor. That, that is not a woman that I can be after. That, that is not something that I can be drawn to because I am supposed to honor that marriage. And, and it says, let the marriage bed be undefiled with your spouse. You know, I think a lot of people say, well, we're married, but we're not married to each other. But does that really matter? Well, that's not what God's talking about. God is talking about the marriage bed. You and your spouse, you and this union are going to be put together and it is undefiled. That, that is seen as something that God has commended and God gives His approval for. What will happen to those who are sexually immoral and adulterous? God will judge. And that is something that should be on our minds in every move of the day. When we think about what is sexually immoral, what is adulterous, and, and we, we begin to try to maybe even define what these things are. And, and, and looking at it and what God sees within the marriage as good and bad. 1 Corinthians chapter 7 gives us uh, a little bit more insight within the whole chapter. And we won't read the whole chapter. We're going to read just the first three verses. Uh, but the whole chapter kind of gives the relationship between a man and his wife. It says, Now concerning the things about which you wrote, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. But because of sexual immoralities, let each man... Each man is to have his own wife, and each woman is to have her own husband. The husband must fulfill his duty to his wife, and likewise the wife also to her husband. When we think about the way the relationship is, each one is to have their own. So there is not plurality. There is, there is not each man is to have his own wives. Uh, it says each man is to have his own wife. It is not to, for each woman to have uh, multiple husbands. It says each woman is to have her own husband. And it is within that single man and that single woman who have become married and become husband and wife that it is now for each other to fulfill their, their emotions and their desires and their drives. And this is commended by God and authorized and encouraged by God for this husband and wife to enjoy this together. If we think about the adulterous, going back to adulterous and sexually immoral, when, when is that sexually immoral? When is that adulterous behavior occurring? In Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, which we looked at last week when we considered murder and the likeness of being hate, Matthew chapter 5 and verse 27, it says this, You have heard, it, you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. We have all heard that. We've read that within the commandments. We read it within the original text. And these... Uh, these children of Israel growing up would have very well been taught all of these things. You shall not commit adultery. And in verse 28, Jesus says, But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away, for it is better that you lose one of your members than, than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away, for it is better that you lose one of your members than that the whole body go into hell. So, Jesus takes it, you know, that, that step further and goes to the heart of what God was talking about within the commandments. It was not just simply that you should not commit adultery. It was not just so sim as simple as saying to Joseph, if you think about Joseph with Potiphar's wife, and Potiphar's wife coming to Joseph, it, it was Joseph said, well, I can look at you and you can dance for me all, but we just we can't commit the act. But it wasn't that way with Joseph. Joseph said, this, this is not the way that it should be. How can I commit this sin against you and God? And he got up and fled. And he got up and, and he went away because he knew that, that the, these kind of feelings and this kind of thought should not be going along with someone that is a child of God, that is following after God. And, and I'm supposed to be different. And so Jesus goes on and he says, this is the way it is to be, that you should not be lustfully looking after someone or, and specifically throwing that from, in the uh, uh, context of male to female. You should not, whoever lusts after a woman with uh, intent should be uh, is committing adultery in his heart. Uh, our society uh, just feeds off of lust. I mean, every, a lot of things are driven by lust. And there was, 
I haven't seen them in quite a while. I don't know if it's because I, I haven't watched as much TV or if they quit playing them. But, I mean, it was where you couldn't even watch a cheeseburger commercial at Hardee's without having it thrown in your face. And I thought, man, what are we doing? Are we trying to sell cheeseburgers here or what are we trying to sell? And so this, this idea is because it will draw your attention. It will hold on to your attention. And, and so the defining line for a lot of people will we'll look at that and go, well, uh, looks at a woman with lust or lustful intent, uh, depending on the version that you may be reading. Well, well when, when does the look become lust? You know, that's, that's what, well, I, didn't, I, didn't, I just looked. You know, that's 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 a guy terminology. I don't know if women have that too or not. Uh, well, I what I I wasn't. I was just looking. You know, I thought it was just. I was just window shopping. I wasn't. I wasn't out doing nothing. I was just looking around. And, and well, well, what are you looking at? And, and so when we when we we go here, the line for me was always it wasn't the first look. It was the second. That was kind of my thinking about it. It was the the first look may have been acknowledging that. That's something different, you know, that's, that's a pretty individual. But the second look was probably the one that was going to get you in trouble. And, and so now I don't even look at all, you know, so I just... <laughs> so so uh, we, we have, but we have to set up these kind of standards here that say, well, when is this? And we all, we, we, the, the unfortunate thing is if we do not train ourselves to stop, then there will never be a stopping point. And so we always have to say this. We have to go, well, okay, I'm not going to do X. Now I'm going to train myself and I'm going to better myself to not do, you know, W. And then I'm not going to do V. And then and we're always trying to get closer to that thing, just like Brother Robert talked about, of striving after perfection. And, and this is one of the hardest things to contain and to control. And, and it's something that we definitely have to lean upon God for. And I think about the... Uh, as I mentioned before, the story with Joseph and Potiphar's wife many times and thinking about how, how skinny I would have been if I would have ran every time and how, how small I would have been and how many marathons I could, have, I could have run if I would have really got up and ran away. Uh, but so many of us, we just think, well, it'll pass. It'll go away. I'm not doing anything about it but we always draw closer to that sinful activity. And I think that's really what Jesus is getting at within this, is that we should not spend much time looking at the opposite sex in this way. This should be something that is reserved for our spouse. So here's the question. How do we keep this command? As I mentioned before, you have to decide that you're going to stop. And then you decide that you will obey this command. And if you set it up as something that is going to be a point in your life and you're going to say, I'm not going to do this, that has to be your first step, is that I am going to obey this command within yourself. The sooner, the better. And, and the sooner, the better, both, uh, both now and in your life, but also uh, for those of age. The younger you are when you make this decision that I will obey this command, the better off you'll be. That I'm not going to put myself in these situations. Why? Because after you have, after time has gone by, you have gotten used to it, it becomes something that's harder and harder to stop. I will follow God's design for sex in my life. It is supposed to be only after I am married. <clears throat> Realize this fact that there are temptations. There, this is something that I have realized for all of my life, that there are temptations. And there, it, there, there is things that are put in your life that you just know came straight from Satan as a straight and simple attack toward you. And, and, and in this way is something that is so blatantly obvious within our lives. Let me ask this question in, in, a, in a like manner. Is temptation a sin? No. We sing, uh, we sing the song, yield not to, tempta to temptation, for yielding is sin. For giving into it is the sinful behavior. But I've talked with and discussed with people of various age ranges that, that feel these temptations, that, that feel these urges, and they go, there's something wrong with me. I'm like, have you actually sinned? 
And, and there's even been uh, times where speaking with a man, and he goes, you know, I, I feel for some reason, I, I don't know why, but there's this draw to, to the same sex. I don't, I don't know what this is. Well, first of all, let's realize that a temptation and mind wandering is not sin. And, and let's, let's see what we can do to address this. But you're doing the first and the greatest thing, which is admitting the fact that I'm being tempted and I need help. But within this, we have such a society, we have within the church uh, society that if I talk about my temptations and I talk about my problems, then everybody's going to know about them. But the thing is, is now that we're able to talk about it, we can start addressing it and start addressing it as a problem. And we can see what we can do to help you or, or to, to encourage you to not give in to that temptation. But we have, we have to change our mentality that, that I am being tempted and I need help. And that is not something to be embarrassed about. That is not something to be ashamed of. It's something that we need to reach out to God for. And that is one of the main reasons that we are all here and gathered together. And so that we can help one another. And so we have to think about and understand that, you know, maybe this isn't something that I just, we just want to broadcast, you know, with the email, uh, email tree kind of deal. But this is something that we do need to talk about. And we need to be open to talking about it. not only temptations within, within this idea of committing, not committing adultery, but also in any array of life. But I think these are the ones that get most hidden for the most amount of time until the inevitable is too late. You know what I mean? And, and this is one of the things that's the hardest to talk about beforehand. Uh, and so we need to realize that there are temptations and that we need to address those and help them in excuse me, any way that we can. We need to find the true road to sexual fulfillment. Uh, it, it is not we're looking for payoff or intimidation, you know, with... Even with it, with our spouse, where it's like, well, you know, I did the honeydew list and I got all the things checked off. Now it's time for you to do my honeydew list, and it's time for you to check my list off. We don't do this intimidation thing. We don't say, well, no, you're going to give me this, or I'm going to leave and go somewhere else. That's not the way it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be uh, set aside exclusively for that husband and that wife. It is supposed to be set aside for all of your life. It is not like, well, once we hit you know, a certain age, we'll break off and we'll go find, uh, we'll find new people. We'll, we'll go find someone else. Uh, I'll trade this model in for a uh, newer, you know, younger, newer model kind of deal. That's not the way it's supposed to be. It's you and your spouse for all of your lives, and that is the true road to sexual fulfillment. Why? Because that's God's design. That's God's plan, and that's the way that God set it up to be. You'll never be satisfied if you break God's commands regarding human sexuality. And uh, that's just the bottom line of it. Uh, people, and specifically men, have, have said, well, the, the, the more I have, the better. Well, no, not necessarily. Maybe, maybe the, you know, men have a huge sex drive. That's what's the, the common theory and common thought. And it's just more the better. Well, not necessarily. It is only within the right way of God's plan that, that it is fulfilling and that it is satisfied and all of those urges will be met. So here's some discussion questions. Uh, can exceptions be made for sexual desires to be fulfilled outside of the spouse? No, no, that's just a simple way. Uh, you can twist it around anyhow, any way you want to. You can say, well, my wife's been bedridden and in a coma for 12 years. You know, that it's, there's only so long that I can go, so this has got to be an exception, right? Is there anything in the Bible about that? Well, no, he says it's between the spouse, between the husband and the wife. And it is not to be said to say the husband is to take advantage of the wife or the wife is to take advantage of the husband in such a way, but it is this. This is the only place. There are no exceptions to be fulfilled outside of your spouse and of your marriage. What is the relationship between faith and sexual fulfillment? Maybe a little harder, deeper to answer. Do according to God's pattern, we just follow our faith 
Okay, so, so yeah, that, that's really what it all sums up to be is that we are walking in faith that, of following God's plan and God's pattern and saying, you know, I, if you think about it from, from your youth, from your youth up before, before you were married per, perhaps, and, and you said, well, you know, I, this is something I really want to do. This is something I really want to uh, partake in. But, but you were going to walk by faith and say, you know, this, I know this is not the plan that God has for me. I know this is not the way that God would have me to go because he's laid it out for me. And although I feel like I know what's best, I'm going to submit to God's will. And I'm going to wait till marriage. And so even now, and then you take that a step, maybe to the next step that, that you're married. Well, I have all these desires and all these urges and I, and I have these feelings toward people and maybe somebody at work or somebody at the gym or some salesman that comes in you know, every other month and, and I have these desires and, and I, I wouldn't have them if it wasn't right. No, you're still, you're still walking by faith and saying this is the only place it is to be is within my, with my spouse. That is the only relationship I to have. And so by doing this and by acting this out and living this way, you are showing your faith. You show your faith also in a way when, <clears throat> when everyone else is maybe catcalling and you go, you know, I don't participate in that. When everyone else is going down the road and they, they window shop, if you will, and you know, we, you go, well, I, I don't do that. Well, why don't you do that? Well, I, I don't believe that's right. I don't think that's the way that God wants me to live. And you set yourself apart one more time and in another way and people are like, they find that and they find that different because you're not like the rest of the world, but how easy is it for just us to fall in with the guys and look and talk? Here's question number three. Is it possible to be, God, to be a godly person without marriage or sexual fulfillment? Yeah. We have multiple examples of that. <clears throat> uh, we, have, we have multiple examples within, within Scripture of that. Uh, we, we have some personal examples of that when we, I just think about uh, who, who's someone that comes to your mind when you think about Bible, Bible figures that were unmarried for our, for our knowledge. Jesus himself, Jesus himself Paul, uh, we, we have multiple examples of this being done. Uh, within the context of a... Uh, uh, within Paul's writing, he, he many times encouraged people to not be married uh, so they may give themselves to the service of God. But he said, I would rather you be married than yield to sexual temptation. To yield to sexual immorality, I would rather you be married. And that's exactly what God, this is why God created marriage. And, and, and so that you can have these desires and these urges to be fulfilled. But, if you can abstain from being married and devote yourself to service to God, then all the more is Paul's writing. Many times we talk about the, young, uh, the younger widows and, and, and they encourage them to remarry so that they not give in to, to sexual immorality. So we think about all of this and, and this is very evident that someone can be a godly person and do many great wonderful works for God without being married. Uh, they, they don't... Some just choose that they don't want to be married. And, and that's very s simply spoken and should be commended as well. Uh, any uh, other comments or uh, questions regarding this commandment? Good. I cannot wait to tell you all how uncomfortable that was. Uh, uh, but the fact of the matter is, it, it is something that, that somebody is going to talk about. And someone, especially, I think about in raising kids, they're going to learn it from somewhere. Uh, are we taking advantage of our opportunities to teach them at home what God wants them to do and how God wants them to live? Uh, as awkward as it is for uh, maybe sometimes to have a, to hear a conversa have a conversation, it's just as awkward to hear the conversation sometimes. But this is nonetheless something that God has put forth for us to learn and to live our lives by. Uh, in just a moment, we're going to sing, Just As I Am, I Come Broken. Uh, and we'll sing that as a song of encouragement. <clears throat> and
In, uh, in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5 and verse 13, it says, You are the salt of the earth. The salt loses its flavor. How shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but under a lampstand, but put it on a lampstand, and that gives light to all who are in the house. Let therefore your so sh let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. In a time that of which we live, I can think of no greater time to be a light. Uh, that we do not become like the world. That we shine bright, that we stand out. And, and of course, and one of the ways that we can do that is by honoring God uh, and His way for us to live concerning marriage and how we honor marriage and how we treat marriage. But also within our society today, it is turning what seemingly to be more and more of a dark world where people are constant in criticism and contrast with one another, stirring up fights and poking and prodding and trying to be a discouragement to anything that someone might desire. How do we stand in as peacemakers? How do we stand in as those who are shining our light before men so that they may see the one whose light truly does shine in that light of Jesus Christ? Let us all try to be light in the world. We don't need to try to hide ourselves when the moment is for us to shine. And I know many times I, I, would, I would rather and it would be easier for me to to hide under a basket or to flip my switch off for just a little bit so that I can be hidden and I don't have to be talked to or I don't have to address it. But the fact is, is that we are called to be light to all those who are in the house. We're supposed to stand up and be light shining down on everyone. If you are here this evening and you are not part of the light of the world, then you have no greater time than now to do that. This is the best time that's ever been given uh, because it may be the last time that's ever been given. I, I was reading a, uh, or watching rather, a discussion between an atheist and, and, a, and a believer and they were just kind of out on the streets kind of deal, a sidewalk meet and greet. And he was talking to the atheist and he said, think about this, suppose you have, you have a lump under your arm and you find out about it and you go to the doctor You've ignored it for quite some time, and the doctor says, look, here's, here's the quick and dirty of it. You have, uh, you have lymphatic cancer. You're going to die in two weeks. There's nothing that can be done. You've waited too long. You're terminally ill. Here's some pills to make you feel better and to help with the pain. But that's all you got. He said, how would that change the way you lived? He said, oh, it, it would definitely change the way I lived. He said, you know, and then he said this line, and I thought how profound it was, the atheist did. He said, I went from dying any second to knowing I die in two weeks. And he said, when you live like you're going to die any second, he said, you don't really think about you're going to die any second because, you know, that's going to be somebody else. He said, but when you really know that it's your turn and your turn's coming up in two weeks, he said, that does kind of intimidate me. But I think about that any second, that I, I could die any second. And we do, we discount that. We're like, well, you know, anybody could die any second, but it's, it's probably not going to be me. And odds are you, you're probably right. But always the question resides, what if? What if it is truly my second? If you're not a Christian or you have a sin in your life and you need forgiveness of it, you need encouragement of the church, we invite you to come as we stand and as we sing this song.
and thank Matt for a good class. I know that's a difficult topic to talk about, and I'm glad that you will not make it. <laughs> Are there any other announcements uh, that need to be made tonight before we dismiss? If not, let's bow our heads and I'll lead us in our closing prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for this day that we've had to come uh, to and worship you, and sing songs of praise, and gather around your table. And we're so thankful for all the many blessings that you bless us with. Father, we pray that you will help us at this time to be safe as we depart this place and that we can be Christians every single day instead of just on Sunday and Wednesdays. And we pray that we will be set apart from the world and that people can look at us and see our example and say that there's something different about him, that hopefully if they can say that about us, that we can reach lost souls and that we can uh, further your kingdom. Father, we pray that there's some sick in our number, that you will heal them and that you will comfort them. There's ones that's lost loved ones that you will comfort them in a way that only you can. Father, help us to be there for them too. Go with us, God, guard, direct us, and keep us safe. And in the end, when we're found faithful, we'll home with us, uh, you in heaven. Forgive us of our sins, in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. <laughs>